spare. It's spare, Papa. I got a big mouth. I've heard that my whole life. You got a big mouth. Anyway, we're happy to have you here this morning. I'm happy to have uh, where it, uh, Crystal. Crystal's with the kids now. She's visiting with us, she's, and she's helping out Morgan. So praise God for our college kids and for their ministry to us. Uh, those of you that are visiting with us, thank you for coming. We pray that you'll enjoy God's word today for us. I did want to make an announcement that there is a wedding in store at our church. There will be a wedding here at the church no, I'm already married, so forget about that thought. But there'll be a wedding here at the church, and it's on December the 2nd, a wedding here at the church. So just wanted to uh, war, uh, uh, alert you on that. Next week, I think, we'll be... Oh, I can't say that's a secret, because they're still thinking about it. I'm just kidding. I'm gonna, where is he? Where is he? Raise your hand. Right there. Raise your hands. Right, there you go. All right. We've been praying for them. God's been working with them and in them and through them. And so we're praying for them for this wedding coming up December the 2nd. Next week, we'll have some uh, invites or something. You're going to be give, giving out something to uh, especially people from the church. All right. Um, I did want you to know that we do, do, we do do weekly visits here at the church. So if you're here and you would like a visit to your home, if you need prayer, if you need someone to... You need the leadership to visit your home for prayer in the home. We do uh, cleansing prayers. We do encouraging prayers. We do whatever, and we come in fellowship as well. So if anyone wants a visit in their home, please let me know. We'll set up a date and make it happen. All right? So a few years ago, it was more than a few years ago, so a good portion of you were not here at the church in those days, but this was right before the pandemic, maybe a year before it, somewhere around there. And... Um, there was a, a lady here who used to work with our children's ministry. She was uh, Heather Bang's sister, uh, Jessica, and she was also a deaconess of the church. So um, something happened. She got a job at another church, and she had to leave, and it, was, it, it hurt us to lose it because her and her family were just dynamic people. But nonetheless, I remember standing here at the, at the altar that day, and, um, and as, as we were saying goodbye to them and embracing them and, and, and loving on them and the family, the entire church, um, a thought came to mind. And it was almost as audible in my heart, in my spirit, uh, the voice was, uh, her mom, her mom will be a deaconess. And uh, I just immediately threw it out because I'm good at doing that. I just threw it out. You know, uh, Cheryl's quite a lady. I, I think most of you who know her know what I'm talking about. Spirit-filled, spirit-led. But I heard that, that voice, and I heard it twice. I heard it twice. And when I hear voices like that, sometimes it, it, it's, it's a prophetic word from the Lord. Something that you don't even realize what it means or how it's going to work out. And I always recommend pray a lot about that before you approach. But I threw it away completely. Especially when I saw that she began to decline in her health sometimes. COVID came. We were not meeting as often. It was awkward to uh, do ministry like that. We were not voting in new leaders or anything like that. So just kind of threw it away and eventually left me. But before it left me, about a week or two, two weeks later, one of the ladies of our church came up to me and told me, um, Cheryl might be a deacon in the future. And it was a woman whose spirituality I highly respect. Uh, and she's not here this morning. And so, but again, I threw it away. I left it alone. And then we had the nominating committee meeting this year. And we met in the library. These are two people that are voted in by you, the church. And two people that are voted in by the board members. And so there were four people and myself. And we discussed future leaders of the church. And unanimously, along with two other people, with three other people, unanimously, all of them, uh, recommended maybe Cheryl. And so the, 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 the vision within me was reignited. But again, I left it alone. She was in church that Sunday. I, I threw it out the window. It's no good. Um, she's not well. I don't want to bother her. She's busy and stuff like that. Just, just thoughts like that. Um, and then I called her on Monday because it's the right thing to do. There was three other people that I contacted during that time, but her I had not. So I called on Monday, and I just had to tell her um, that had, her name had come up. 
I didn't expect anything. I said, her name had come up. Just wanted you to know that. I think it's, it's only fair to let you know that people look up to you like that in our church. And I want her to share the rest. Sister Cheryl, please. Thank you, Paul. Good morning. When Pastor had called me on Monday, um, he probably noticed that um, I sounded rather excited when he told me this because I have always been taught that if you have if you get a word from the Lord, um, that there will be a confirmation. And the Sunday before, um, the deaconesses were having a meeting and never had crossed my mind anything about being a deaconess. Never, pastor never said anything to me before. And But that Sunday, as I walked by, walking out, I saw them and um, it popped into my head you need to be there with them. And I thought, what? <laughs> um, but, and never had crossed my mind, like I said, but, and I don't usually speak to myself in my head in the third person, but um, I, I walked out and into my head again popped, as I, I was outside the church, it popped into my head. Oh, they wouldn't want you because um, you miss church sometimes, and you probably don't volunteer for enough things. And I told Pastor this, and he said, put that out of your head. That is not true. Um, but I was rather excited because of the confirmation. Because I thought, could that be God saying to me he wanted me to be a deaconess if they had asked me? And... Um, when Pastor called me, I thought, this is a confirmation of that, that that really was the Holy Spirit speaking to my spirit to, you know, to say, this is something you, that you should consider. And um, after I hung up with Pastor, I began to pray, and I've prayed ever since then, um, very strongly over the weekend, when Pastor said he asked me to come up, and... Um, I really didn't even, there were some things that Satan allowed to pop into my head, but I pretty much said that, uh, there's an old chorus we used to sing, Jesus, use me, and oh Lord, don't refuse me, for surely there's a work that I can do. And though it may be humble, Lord, help my will to crumble, and though the cost be great, I'll work for you. So um, that's just all I wanted to say. Thanks. or what you feel you can do for God or you can't do when God when God is in it there's no one that is exempt from God's ability to use them or people at any time and so we're thankful for Cheryl be in prayer for her uh, we pray for her I know I know God wants to use her and he does he's already using her amen he's already using her she's a blessing but um, there was a calling there that um, that I failed to follow up with and I apologize for that um, but he did not fail to follow it up. He's faithful to that. Amen. So we continue to pray for our church and our people and for what God is doing. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's quite a God, right? Yeah. Uh, so, how, so how many of you were here on Friday for the movie? Right? We had, yeah, I thought, that, you know, I just wanted at least 20. I really was in my heart talking about 35 or 40, but, you know, um, it was a dynamic movie. And I pray that, uh, I, I pray that it had has impacted you as much as impacted me. It has me thinking a lot um, in comparison. But if you were here and you watch, if you saw that movie, you you 
you were reminded, you were reminded or realized how much our world is changing. Things that 20 to 30 years ago were, uh, were, were not allowed, the things that were uh, considered uh, intolerable, inappropriate, or outright offensive 20 to 30 years ago, today they are a celebrated norm of our day. In fact, if that man who was in the movie uh, Russell were about around today, um, he would see what he saw then, which was a hundred years into his future. He would see that as just bad habits that people pick up and eventually grow out of in comparison to the destructive choices that our world is making today. I wonder what his response would be. But I kind of think a little bit what the response of God is. You know, let, let me say, let me, here's a thought, right? The world has changed. The world is changing. And the world will continue to change. But guess what? We are also being changed as time goes on. And I'm not talking about just any change. I'm talking about a change that will determine the kind of life that we live and, and what we get out of life. And there's only one of two things that can make that happen. It's, 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 it's basically the system of the world. It's the world and its system. It's the world and its system that, you know, it's, its pattern of living, its, its mindset, its perspective. It's the world, it's society, it's the world the way that it is. Even either that is going to change us. Because that's what is changing people. That is, that's what is changing. Our world is changing. And so it's philosophies, it's perspectives, it's way of being, it's way of living, it's way of doing things is changing. And it's also changing people. Or it's God who changes us. Times are changing. And times are changing people. But God who does not change that's the awesome thing about God. You know that? He's a, the theological term is he is a, an, an immutable God. He's immutable. That means that he doesn't change. So, so think about it like this. He doesn't change, but he's all about changing. He who does not change is all about changing lives, changing circumstances, changing people. In fact, often it's in changing our circumstances is where we learn to be changed by him or allow him to change us. Because in changing our circumstances, he's changing us. And so God is in, in the business of changing. So at the end of the day is, uh, who are we waiting for to change us? Because times are changing. And people are changing. And, 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 and right now, as we think about it, change is happening, even in our hearts and in our lives. And so the question would be, who is it that you're waiting for to change you? The thing is, we all have, we all have circumstances in our lives. And he, we all have issues in our life. And I wonder how many are seated in here right now today or hearing us online who have a circumstance in their life that they just don't know how to resolve. They don't, how to, they don't know how to change it. They don't know how it's going to change. How in the world is it going to change? I, I've tried so many times. People have tried. It doesn't change. It can't change. I can't change because God is still the God who brings change and can make change at any time. When we allow him to. When we allow him to. So our springboard text for today is up on the screen. Psalm 130 and verse 5. The psalmist says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. The NIV says, my inner being waits. My soul waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word, I put my hope. Before we go any further, would you please stand with me and join me in prayer? The title is up on the screen. Who are you waiting for? Because change is bound to happen. Change is happening. Change is bound to come. Who are you waiting for, for that change? Let's pray. Spirit of God, you are all that we need. Everything else takes back seat to who you are. And so, Holy Spirit, 
we invite you to be the one that brings forth this word. We invite you to be the one that uh, quickens our hearts and softens our heart. We invite you to be the one who uh, stimulates our heart regarding the things of God. We pray that you would, Holy Spirit, uh, silence every attempt of the enemy to interfere. We pray for the recordings. We pray for those at home. Uh, we pray for the speakers here. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, supersede, intervene, lead and guide and direct, propel your word to go forward into hearts and lives. You know the changes that we need. And we thank you that you're a God who, though you don't change, you change people. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, minister to us today, speak to us today, but above all, uplift and glorify Christ, our Savior, our King. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, so the world is changing, right? It's changing in so many different ways. And it changes people regardless of their age. Regardless of their gender, regardless of who they are, the world is changing people, turning them and keeping them as far away from God as possible. Especially in these days, when the prophetic picture is beginning to fall into place, when the passages, the pages of Scripture are becoming more obvious and more obvious, and the closer we get to that day, the clearer it's going to be. We'll be saying in time, that's what that meant. Watch the news, read the scriptures, you'll see some flashlighting going on in his word. But things are changing. But, you know, although the world is changing, uh, God also changes the lives who realize the direction that our world is going in, the direction that our world is taking, um, and turn to God instead. It's, it's those who realize that there's only one of two things that's bringing change. It's our world system or God. That's it. Our world system or God. We need to allow that change. We need to want that change. But one of those two is what's changing people's lives today. It's what's changing our world. Either the world system or God changes the world. And that's up to you and to me as individuals. God doesn't change, but he changes people. He changes circumstances. And in changing circumstances, you probably hear this several times, he also changes people. So I want to talk to you today is what do we need to do in order to see uh, and, and in order to see and to experience? What do we need to do in order to see how and why God can do this? What do you and I need, <clears throat> need to do in order to see how and why God uh, can do this? <clears throat> so let me just share this. Let's see how God takes it because it's been going back and forth all week with me here on this one. <laughs> but uh, he knows. So up on the screen, I want you to notice um, that we're to, we're to sit still. Sitting still is so very important when it comes to God being God and God doing a work in my life. Notice this text up on the screen. Sit still, right? Ruth chapter 3 verse 18. And then she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Sit still, my daughter, until you know the matter and how it will turn out. For the man will not rest. So you remember the story? Elimelech... Uh, Elimelech is married to Naomi, and they have two sons. And because of a famine in Bethlehem, they decide to move for a season some 40 miles southeast to Moab. And when they get to Moab, Elimelech, his wife, and their two sons, not too long after that, Elimelech dies. And the two sons, what they do is they marry two Moabite women, and 10 years later, the two sons also die. And then Naomi decides that she wants to move back to her native land. She wants to go back the 40 miles now uh, north to Moab, uh, to Bethlehem, to move to her country. And, and the two daughters-in-law, uh, they want to go with her. And she does everything to persuade them to stay in their own land with their own people. 
One of them agrees to do that, but the other one, who would be Ruth, decided that no. She wanted to go with Naomi to Naomi's land. And so Naomi agrees. You know, she obliges. And when they get there, Naomi realizes that she, she decides she wants to sell the property of her deceased husband. And she also knows the procedure there. So what she does is she, she talks Ruth into, into um, somehow enticing uh, Boaz. She, she encourages her to make a pass at Boaz, who would be the next kinsman redeemer after the next one. And she also knew that whoever the next kinsman redeemer would inherit the widow of the deceased person who owned the land. So she knew something might be perking up. And so she encourages her to do that. And, and, and so I want you to know that at this point, uh, Ruth doesn't know the God of Naomi. She doesn't know who he is. She doesn't know, understand everything. But, but there was something about Ruth's life, about Naomi's life, that, that got her attention. There was something about Ruth's commitment that caused her to want to know more about what Ruth was going through. Who the God was. She wanted to know that. She wanted to see that. There was something there that was irking her the wrong way. A, 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 a positive way. She wanted to know the God of Ruth. Of Naomi. And so think about that. Um, so a kinsman redeemer is someone who. A kinsman redeemer is someone who has. By law. Has all the rights to purchase, it has to be usually, preferably, a male who is a relative of the deceased. And he has the first rights to purchase his property in order to keep it within the clan. And so, and Ruth knew that, knew, uh, Naomi knew that there, was, that there was a kinsman redeemer who would be purchasing this land. Ruth doesn't know at all what's going on here. Uh, she just knows that she wanted to leave with this godly woman. And in verse chapter 1 and verse 16, after Ruth is trying to, Naomi is trying to discourage her, Ruth says, she says to Naomi, think about this, she says to her, uh, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And she says, and, and your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. I believe this was a moment of conversion. For, Naomi, for Ruth. By the way, this is a powerful story. Uh, the, Ruth of, the story of Ruth and Naomi. And I've not ever heard a message. I've heard many messages on Ruth. But I've not heard any on Naomi. And I'm thinking maybe we need to bring a series of messages on Naomi. That's quite a woman of God there. But this is Ruth sees and visualizes and experiences uh, the life of this woman of God, that she would be willing to leave everything behind. Isn't that what a missionary does? She's willing to leave everything behind and go to the land of this woman of God, Naomi. She wanted to become one of her people, like an Israelite, and she wanted to, to worship her God. The Moabites worshipped all kinds of gods. She was willing to leave all those gods behind because they were gods with small g's. And she wanted to meet the God of Naomi. And so something happens there. And then in chapter 2 and verse 12, may, may, uh, Naomi says, May the Lord repay you for, you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the God of Israel under, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So Naomi embraces the passion and the desire of, of Ruth. And she realizes Naomi must have known that God was... He was about to do something. He was about to bring change. I don't know if she knew exactly what kind of change God was thinking here. But she knew that, that God had to be in this. She had to be a woman of faith. And that's what got the attention of Ruth. That this woman who just lost her husband and lost her two children did not lose her spiritual connection, her spiritual composure, her spiritual love, her commitment to Christ. It was something about Naomi's faith. It was something about Naomi's commitment and her surrender to the Lord that got the attention of Ruth so much that she would be willing to leave everything behind as long as she could know the God of Naomi. 
So to make a long story short, right? Here's what happens. So, so Boaz goes to the next kinsman redeemer and he says to him, basically, this is the situation. Naomi is selling the property of Elimelech. And this is what you need to do. You'd have to marry the widow of the deceased. In this case, it would be Ruth because Naomi was too old for that. And Ruth was her husband would have been the next one in line to take the place of Elimelech. And so that kinsman redeemer, when he hears that, says, uh-uh, I will not marry her. And so he gives his rights of a kinsman redeemer, he gives it to Boaz. And so now Boaz happily uh, pays the price for the property and he marries Ruth. And you know what happens after that, right? Let me read to you. It's not on the screen. Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. It says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Verse 16 and 17. And then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him, the grandma, cares for the child. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Naomi knew that, that God was doing something. Her faith in God, the story of Naomi, her faith in God, her countenance, her connection, her commitment... Uh, her, her, respond, her, her, her reliance on the Lord, she had to know that God was about to do something. Why? Because of the connection she had with God. She just didn't know what it was that God was doing. She knew he was doing something because she guided um, uh, Ruth through the process, but she just didn't know what God was doing. She didn't know that what God was about to do was not just to, to bless her and her family and her situation and to bless Ruth. But that what God was about to do was to bless the people of Israel. That God was about to bless the Jewish people. But not only the Jewish people. He was also about to bless you and me. And all generations. If you think of the story. Because in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 17. Some 1300 years later. The Bible says that from the lineage of David came Jesus the Messiah. God was about to bring about a change. Let me just say that, that when, when we're told to, to sit still in Scripture, it doesn't mean that we're to, to sit and do absolutely nothing and just wait for God to bring the change. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm to sit and, 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 and wait for God to do something in my life. It means that we're to be at ease, that we're to be relaxed. That we're to trust God and believe God that God is able to do something and that he will do something. And he'll do it in his time, not in my time, but in his time. And so it's, it's believing that he's able. It's believing that. And, and, and just know that, 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 uh, that Ruth didn't sit around when she got there to Bethlehem. No, she would go daily to the fields and she would, like a poor person, she would pick up the scraps of grain that the harvesters were dropping on the ground. She'd pick up scraps of grain to try to get some kind of food for her and for her mother-in-law. So she wasn't sitting around doing nothing. But when she was told to, to sit still, she is, she is being told to, to, to believe in this God that you've put your life into. Believe in this God that you've come to follow. Believe in this God that you've come to, to trust. Believe in him. He's going to take care of this. He's going to do something. Though she didn't know exactly what God was going to do. And perhaps, perhaps because of that incident, in the story of Naomi and Ruth, perhaps is the reason why some of us this morning are followers of Jesus. I don't know. But God had to open the door for all people, not just the Jew, but also to the Gentile. That's where I come in. So when I get to glory, I don't know what it's going to be like fully up there, but if I see um, Naomi and Ruth, I'm going to, thank them for following God because that 
open the passageway for me to get into glory as well. And so to, to sit still insinuates uh, relying on God. It, 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 it tells us to trust Him, to believe Him, to, to hold on to Him, to know that though things may not seem well or seem right, He's going to bring about some kind of change. And that I'm waiting, I'm going to pray and do my work for the Lord and do what God called me to do, but in the process of doing all that, I'm waiting for Him to meet my situation and to bring about the kind of change that's also going to change me. So God works through circumstances, and as He changes circumstances in our life that we're entrusting to Him while, while doing our work for the glory of God, living God-honoring lives, while we're doing that, we're believing God to bring about the change according to His glory and in His time. So how does God bring about change? How can God change your life, your, my, my life, our situation, when it comes to trusting and waiting, we just sit still? And entrust Him to do that work in us that only He can do and through us. Notice, secondly, up on the screen. We're to stand still. Exodus 14 and verse 13. It says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He, that is the Lord, will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. It's quite a story. As I was reading that story, God gave me another message for another day. <laughs> three messages. I was trying to work on three messages the other day. Yeah. So um, you'll see never again. No more. So let me, let's, let's, let's remember the setting here. So the setting is, if you remember the story, so the people of Israel were in slavery there in Egypt for over 400 years. And uh, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, witnessed miracle after miracle. He witnessed 10 plagues sent by the power of God to the Egyptians. And those plagues, each one of them smacked the God of the Egyptians they had at least 10 gods, and every one of them, te those 10 gods, was smacked in the face with the, with the plagues that God was sending that their gods could do nothing about. They couldn't stop them. And so after 10 different plagues and Pharaoh changing his mind back and forth, finally he cooperates with Moses and with God, and he lets the people go. And then not too long after that, Pharaoh recants, changes his mind, calls his soldiers together and the chariots, and they go in pursuit of the people of Israel. And when the people of God looked back, they saw this vast army of soldiers with swords coming at them, like a, a wall of people coming. And they begin to panic, and they cry out to God, and then they, they blame Moses or basically curse him for bringing them out into the desert, and they say this. This is where that other message is going to come, all right? They say we would prefer to be slaves in Egypt than to be out here in the desert. Sometimes God has to take us through the desert. We'll leave it at there, okay? But nonetheless, that's what they say to Moses, and then Moses, he says to them, he says to them, listen. He says, stand still. And see what the Lord is about to do. He basically says, stand still and wait and see what God is about to do in your life. God is going to bring change. And in bringing change, he's going to change your very lives. And so the story continues. So, so let me just say that when, when, you're, when you're sitting, when you're sitting metaphorically, when you're sitting and waiting, you're at ease, right? You're, you're at ease you're relaxed, you're sitting, you're waiting, you're comfortable there, um, trusting the Lord at that time metaphorically. But when you're standing metaphorically, you're more apt to get up and run at a moment of challenge. You're more apt to, uh, to fearfully run or take matters into your own hand. Which is exactly what the people of God would have done if they could have. There was nowhere to run. 
But if they could have, they would have won. They were up against the wall. And Moses had to remind them. Mo Moses is, t is telling them, hey, give God a chance. Give God a chance. Give him a chance to change your situation. Give him a chance to show you who he is. Give him a chance to show you what he can do. And church, there are circumstances in our own lives. Perhaps there's some of us in here this morning that have overwhelming circumstances that cannot be resolved. That we've already received a lie that this can't change. It never will change. You will always be like this or this will always happen. And, and, and yet if we can only give God a chance. Stand still, he said, and witness the deliverance of God. Nothing is impossible with God. He can do what we think he can't do. And he can definitely do what the devil says he can't do. And so it's trusting God. Now let me just say that God is, God's not always in a rush. Sometimes we wish he did it yesterday, right? But it's today. And, and, and sometimes we, <laughs> we worry about tomorrow when we should leave that in God's hand. Remember that today is the tomorrow we worried about yesterday. Where did it get you? It, 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 you know, it, it's trusting God. It's, it's relying on But sometimes God, he doesn't answer immediately. Sometimes he does. But sometimes he doesn't. And oftentimes he, often, that's not a good word, Patty, so throw that one up. Often, he says, often he's doing it because he's working out something in our own lives. It, he, it, he's, he knows the timing. He knows the way. He knows how to do it. So he's working out a situation in our lives. And sometimes he does it because there's something in our lives that is interfering with what he wants to do. I have to say that one more time. Sometimes God doesn't answer or bring about the change or open that door or fix or resolve that situation in our lives because there's something in our lives that, that is getting in the way of what God is trying to do in our lives. And so we blame God for not answering the prayer or we blame God for not opening the door or we blame God for not making it clear to us or we blame the devil for what he did and instead of blaming God, of blaming the devil, pointing at them. Remember that there are three fingers pointing at you. Is 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 knowing that is knowing that maybe there's something in me. We go through this in sessions of uh, of counseling often. Okay, it always begins with what? Why is God doing this to me? You ever? How many of you ever asked that question? Come on. All right. Why is God doing this? Why is He allowing this? Right challenges and conflicts why is he allowing this i mean job asked that many times uh several times he asked that in his own form of words but nonetheless why is god and sometimes we should ask what am i doing sometimes we should ask is there something in me of me or because of me that is keeping this from happening is the issue here god Oh, is the issue here me? If it's God, I'm going to wait and trust and believe. I'm going to sit still. I'm going to stand still. I'm going to hold on to him. But, but if it's me, I want to know what it is that I need to change. And sometimes God's already been telling us. And he might say it through his word. He might say it in your prayer life. He might say it through a song. He might say it through a sermon. He might say it through a brother or sister in Christ. Uh, who he's going to use because sometimes we're not hearing God we're distant because the choices we're distant he's still there he loves us the same way today he did before we were distant his love doesn't change he doesn't change he's the same all the time yesterday today forever but our circumstances are changing our connection and our harmony with God and he wants to help us change that but we play a role in that he we play a role in that and so in the case as is the case if, when you're sitting still uh, when you're standing still, it's the same thing. He doesn't call us to just stand there and wait for him to do something. Maybe the Israelites uh, had reason to stand there because there was not a whole lot they can do except to get ready for what's next, you know, get ready for what's next, you know. But for the most part, 
standing still means that I'm, I'm standing on him. I'm standing in his word. I'm standing in his promises. I'm holding on to him. I know he'll make it happen according to his will. And if he doesn't make it happen because it's not his will, he'll make it happen in me that I'll understand and I'll accept and I'll be strong in the Lord. Because we learn, right, don't we? We learn through circumstances. And sometimes the circumstances are not quite what we wanted, right? But we learn from Anybody ever experienced that? That the circumstances weren't exactly what I was looking for. If it's just me and Cheryl, praise God. The rest of us, the rest of you pray for us. But that it's happened that, that this is what I wanted. But what I wanted didn't happen. But I learned today what it was that I needed to learn from that not happening. You understand? Maybe a few other hands now. Yeah, I got that one. All right, so two or three more hands. Praise God. My wife way in the back. I hope that has nothing to do with me, baby. I love you. But, uh, uh, but, <laughs> but God is good. Amen? So, so it, it's, it's who he is. So Isaiah 30 and verse 18 says, Blessed are all, all who wait on the Lord. Blessed are all who wait on the Lord. Why? Because in waiting, it's in waiting that we learn to trust. It's in waiting that we learn to, that we, we find hope. It's in waiting that we realize who he is. It's in waiting that we realize his ability and his faithfulness. Even in the process of waiting, in the process of waiting, we're not waiting alone. He's there to carry us through that, that, that time, that process of waiting. So it's not like God says, okay, well, I'm going to answer your prayer. It'll be about 13 days from now, but just sit there and wait. I'll be back. I got other things to attend to. Is that the kind of God we serve? No. He's a God who is... It's almost as if God puts his, his, his hands on us, right? And he says, my child, I, I know your situation. And I know what you're praying for. And I know what you're going through. It'll be a while, but I'm here with you. And I'm going to take care of you. Trust me and believe me. And in that process of waiting, while waiting, in that process of waiting, God is developing in you and in me uh, things changes in our lives and in our perspective of living and in our faith in God, changes that are so absolutely necessary to prepare me for future battles. And so he, he, he tells us, we're told to, to, to sit still, leaning on God, hoping in God, being faithful to God, honoring Him, honoring His Word. He tells us to stand still. Sometimes we're sitting. Sometimes we're standing. I also think that a moment of standing is like we're, we're, we're ready. It's, 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 it's about to happen. We're, we're seeing things begin to fall into place. I'm no longer sitting waiting. Now I'm standing and, and I just know it's about to happen. I know it's going to happen. Just make sure you're not running ahead of God. I always say that. Don't run ahead of God. Don't rush Him. He knows the timing. At the end of the day, God's timing is better than ours. How many times have we made a choice in our lives where we went ahead of God and today we live to regret it? Now, let me just say, regret is not something that we carry with us and always feel bad about. And No, regret is something that we look back today and we, we, we learn what we learned about it. And it helps us in the present and the future. We learn from mistakes. God will use that to teach us things we need to learn. Amen? And then lastly, he says to be still. Lastly, be still, Psalm 46 and verse 10. A verse many of us know. He says, be still and know that I am God. This is God speaking. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Our earth is a mess, isn't it? Our world is a mess. God says, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted in this world. In other words, I am on the throne. I'm still the final authority. And guess what? Five years from now, he'll still be the same God. Five years from now, this verse will be applicable then. It'll have the same meaning and the same message. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So the content here is that although... Although everything around us seems to be falling apart, although the world itself seems to be about to fall deep into the, the deepest part of the seas, although everything to see, tends to be in havoc and falling apart, perhaps the psalmist, if he were around today, he would, uh, he would understand what we're going through in our world. But he says, in spite of all that, God will prevail. He's on the throne. 
He's in charge and he's in control. He has it all in his hands. He's able. And so we have to see beyond the circumstances and the situations of our world and see him. And he's bigger. And the more we look to God and see the size of God and the awesomeness of God, the more these things down here that are going on are small. Think about that. And what's funny is that um, there's 11 verses in this text of uh, Psalm 46. And God only speaks one time. You hear his voice just in verse 10. That's it. The other verses is the psalmist talking about, basically the psalmist is declaring, he's declaring who God is. He's declaring what God has done. He's declaring what God can do. And then God, nine verses later, interjects. And he says, be still and know that I am God. In other words, God reminding the, the psalmist of, of everything that God has done. It's almost as if God is saying to him, basically using the words that the psalmist used, remember who I am. Remember what I've done. Remember the things I've done in your own personal life. Remember the things you've heard about me. The things you, you heard in sermons in church. Remember the things you read about me in the word. Remember who I am. I'm at work here. I'm doing something. I'm bringing about a change. I'm doing something different. Trust me through this time. I'll make it happen. And so he's interjecting, reminding the psalmist of everything that he is and everything that he just declared. So he's confirming his word. I love when God confirms his word. You ever go into the word uh, looking for a word of confirmation? Where he just confirms. It's almost as if God raps his, about, if you can just picture this God. Well, the word became flesh, right? We know that. So, But imagine God's word, the Bible, just putting its arms around you. His word. It, it's wonderful to be hugged by someone and all that. Our children, our spouses, whatever it might be. To be hugged by someone. But imagine God's word coming to you at a moment of need and desperation. And just embracing you. And that's what I picture with the psalmist here. He's quoting all these things about who God is and what God has done. And, and all of a sudden in verse 10 God says, be still and know that I am. God, I will be exalted in the earth, in the world. I will be exalted. Be still and know. You ever been embraced by God's word? It's, it's awesome. It's a beautiful moment the way he, it's almost like, wow, boy, did I need that. You ever got a good hug from someone at a moment of desperation? A timely, right? Like, boy, man, and you're just weeping. And it's a hug that causes you to weep because you needed that. Well, that's what God's word does here as the psalmist quotes these verses. God interjects. Let me just say that as is the case, you know, with sitting still and, and standing still. Um, again, God doesn't call us to be still and do nothing. Uh, I mean, we're to be at ease and we're to be relaxed and we're to... And, and, and we're to to know that God is with us, that we're not alone, that's part of the being still. I'm still in his presence. I'm still in him. I'm still in his word. I'm still in his promise. I'm leaning on him. But that does not exempt me from honoring God. It, it, it doesn't give us reason not to be in the word. We're still to be in the word. We're, we're still to be praying. We're still to be seeking God's face. We're still to be seeking his word. We're still to be honoring him. We're still to be doing his will. Um, we're being still in his promises. We're being still in his word. We're being still in what he said. We may not know where it's going to come from, but we know it's going to come because of his promises. We, not know how, we may not know how we're going to resolve our issue. I don't know how in the world this is going to work out. But we know that it's going to work out because of his promises. I don't know uh, how this is going to happen. I don't know where that's going to come from. I don't know how this door is going to open. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I know that, uh, that, that I'm in his hands. And I know that I'm not alone. And I know that he's faithful. Because he's promised us in his word. So be still and know that I am God. Remember the, the verse. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I put my hope. Our hope is in the word. We, we sit still, we stand still, and we be still 
uh, in his word and in his promises, that's what, that's what stimulates us to hold on. I'm holding on because he said so. And even if it doesn't go my way, as all of us can testify, there have been times like that. We, we want to pray, Lord, your will be done, not mine, because Jesus taught us how to do that in Gethsemane, right? Your will, not mine. We want to pray, Lord, your will be done. And I always recommend people that make sure that your ultimate desire for what you're praying for is for the glory of Jesus. If it's for the glory of Jesus, there's not a whole lot to lose. If it's for the glory of self, then that's a different story. So we want to pray, and sometimes that's why he doesn't answer our prayers. But it's leaning on his promises and waiting on him. It was Martin Luther who said, Martin Luther said that, that my conscience is a prisoner of the word of God. That his word, my conscience is, is in prison to his word. And church, when the devil accuses you, let the word of God assure you. And make sure that, that, make sure that, that you don't just believe the Bible but that you also have the author of the Bible in your life. That, that, that he's the one that's leading. It's, it's not about knowing how many people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I always say they were sad, you see. Uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they knew the word. The devil knows the word. So make sure that you don't just know the word. You hear the false prophets scroll, scroll, quote scripture like, you name it. The devil knows the word. And so it's make sure you know the author of the word. That you're walking hand in hand with Jesus. That through your storm and through your trial and through your challenges and through your conflicts and through your circumstances. That you are holding on to Jesus. Our peace and our hope should not come from what we have. They should come from who we have. Our hope, our peace, our consolation should not come from, okay, everything worked out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Life is good. Times are good because everything worked out. Our hope has to come from the one who gives us hope to begin with. Because when we start trusting in materialism or in our things that we have or that we've attained, those things might block us from the word. It's him. He's the center. Our joy comes from him. Because if everything that we're hoping in today is gone tomorrow, what are we going to do? What do you do? When everything you hope in is gone, I'll tell you someone who will not be gone. And that's Jesus. He said, I will never leave you. Your hopes might leave. Your materialism might leave. People might leave. Circumstances. But, but I will never leave you. And when we stand before the Lord, it's not going to be about what we have. It's going to be about who we have. What did you do about Jesus at the end of the day? And so God is faithful. God changes circumstances during that waiting period. Often we're waiting and, and it's during the waiting period that he changes circumstances. And when he changes circumstances, it gives us reason to trust him. In changing our circumstances, God then should change us. We're changed because of what he's done in our lives. We gave him a chance somewhere. Those of you, right? If you're born again today, you gave him a chance one day to prove himself faithful. And he has. And in the process of waiting, you've learned to trust him all the more, right? So the world is providing change. The world is, 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 is bringing change. The world is changing and it will continue to change. And it's changing in such a way that is, that is changing people's perspective, their, their pattern of living, their mindset, their perspective, their thought life, their desires, their passions. It's changing people. But I want you to know that God is also changing people. And there's only one of two that can change. It's either the world system that's going to change you and me. is the world system that is being taught on TV, on the news, is the world system. If you listen very, very carefully, it's that system that is being endorsed, that is changing our world. So it's either the world system, it's philosophy, it's way of doing things that's changing you, or it's God that's going to change us. And the wonderful thing about God is that he loves us so much that he gave us the freedom to choose which of the two we want to be changed by. Who are you waiting for? Who are you waiting for? If we're told to, to sit still and to stand still and to be still, and other translations call it wait or to be in waiting, who is it that you're waiting for 
to bring about the change in your life that you need. Because in changing our circumstances, he changes us. And when he changes us, we're not the same. We're different people. And God is faithful to his word. Yeah, I'm talking about a total different kind of change. I'm talking about a change that will determine the kind of life we live and will determine um, what we do with our lives. I want to read this as I get ready to close. It's called Still Waiting. Maybe you can identify with some of this. Just remember who you're waiting with. Waiting, yes, patiently waiting till next steps made plain shall be to hear with the inner hearing the voice that will call for me waiting yes quietly waiting no need for an anxious dread shall he not assuredly guide me who giveth me daily bread waiting yes hopefully waiting with hope that needn't grow dim the master is pledged to guide me, and my eyes are unto him. Waiting, yes, expectantly waiting. Perhaps it may be today. The master will quickly open the gate to my future way. Waiting, tr trustfully waiting. I know, though I've waited long, that while he withholds his purpose, his waiting cannot be wrong. Waiting, yes, waiting, still waiting. The master will not be laid. He knoweth, he knoweth that I am waiting for him to unlatch the gate. Waiting, still waiting. It's in the waiting period that we learned that we learn the most valuable lessons in the spiritual realm. But I don't know if you're like me. I don't like waiting sometimes. I smell the food being cooked, but I don't want to smell it anymore. I want to start connecting with it in an intimate way. <laughs> waiting, still waiting. He's a faithful God. He loves you and cares for you more than you could ever imagine. The waiting period is not a punishment. The waiting period is a process in which the Holy Spirit is using in your life and my life to shape and sharpen our character and our commitment to teach us how to rely on Him and how to depend on Him and how to trust on Him. That's the waiting period. If, if waiting takes longer than I want it to, that means that there was something more He wanted to do in my life. And when there's something more that God wants to do in our lives, that means that He's looking to make us that much more better. Waiting. Still waiting. The question is, who are you waiting for? Who are you waiting to bring about change in your life? Because our world is changing. It's changing day by day. And we're also changing day by day. Let me just say that change is bound to happen. The question is, who are you waiting for to bring the change? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We praise you for your grace this morning. We thank you for your word and for your reminder. For reminding us that you're here with us. Reminding us that you've not deserted us. Reminding us that uh, your love is real. When you said, I love you, you meant it. When you said, I care for you, you meant it. When you said, I'm here for you, you meant it. When you said, I will never leave you, you meant it. And even in the waiting period of our circumstances, you're still here with us. So fear is gone and worry is gone in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your word. Help us to know how to sit still and how to stand still and how to be still in you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you please stand?